Thanks, Mike. How's it going? Thanks very much indeed, uh, Derek, for that introduction, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about some perhaps different aspects of uh, diffusion magnetic resonance in pharmaceutical and chemical reaction engineering research that we as a big group are doing in Cambridge. So, <clears throat> brief outline today, uh, I'm going to just talk about two aspects of the work that I've been involved in, how we use magnetic resonance uh, diffusion and also relaxometry to study pharmaceutical products. And we're looking at solid oral dosage forms and we want to understand how drugs are released for those when we challenge them with dissolution media. And so I'll talk about how we're going to quantify pore size evolution during dissolution and also how we can use other bits of magnetic resonance data to provide inputs for parameter-free modeling of that drug dissolution. Second part of the talk will be uh, some really interesting work I think we're doing in operando heterogeneous catalysis. And so now we have the ability to do magnetic resonance at up to 350 degrees C and up to 30 bar of gas pressure with specialized reactors. And that's going to give us some understanding of gas liquid mass transport, which we heard about from your cargo yesterday, and look at deactivation mechanisms of heterogeneous catalysis in action. So my own personal research in the last 10 years has kind of been focused on looking at controlled release drug delivery. And we have generally three types of devices. We have swelling matrix controlled release devices, where drug release is controlled by diffusion and erosion mechanisms. And we also have these nice fancy... Uh, very expensive laser hole, solid dose, laser hole drilled solid dosage forms, which here then the drug is released under the osmotic pressure of a swelling matrix. And so we can image this all in real time, get the quantitative information of absolute water concentration, T2 relaxation, there's a nice diffusion map, but also the velocity map as well, using um, uh, fast rare diffusion imaging with uh, preconditioning of diffusion and also T2. But today, I'm going to, because it's a historical talk, I'm going to talk about varying coating thickness drugs. And in fact, we're actually going to ignore the coating, and I'm just going to say a little bit about the actual pellets inside and how their porosity evolves once we challenge them with a dissolution medium. So these are the sort of things we're looking at. These are capsules like you might get something like Contact 400 for cold and flu. So if you strip those down into their constituents. We know that there's a gel outer capsule that dissolves very quickly, but then there's lots and lots of tiny little beads, around, generally around about one to two millimeters inside, that contain excipients and the active drug ingredients. So here's our system of the formulation under investigation. This work was sponsored by Merck, Sharp and Dome about 10 years ago. And we're just looking at a model formulation here. Here the active pharmaceutical ingredient is chlorpheniramine malleate, then your excipients are consisting of soluble and insoluble parts of the matrix as well. And so what we're doing is we're going to take these pellets, we're going to challenge them with a phosphate buffer solution at 37 degrees, we're going to stop that, we're then going to take the pellets out of the medium, put them into a 5 millimeter NMR tube and run PFG diffusion experiments on them. Why do we want to do that? Well we want to look at pore size evolution. And so if we're going to do that, what we're going to need to know something about is the surface to volume ratio and also the tortuosity of the porous matrix itself. So PFG NMR will give us the surface to volume ratio and tortuosity, but we also need to know something about the T2 distribution because then if we want to look at pore sizes, we're going to know, as the equation says there, we're going to have to have the surface to volume ratio. So we took this inspiration actually, again, because it's a historical talk, from the seminal paper of Mitra and Sen back in 1992, who found that you can get information about the geometrical structure of porous matrices by looking at the diffusion within that structure. And the whole point here is that you look at diffusion over different time scales. <coughs> so if we do diffusion over experiment with a big delta very small, then the root mean squared displacement of that time is then very much l smaller than the actual pore size. And therefore, the diffusion is actually, because it's hitting the walls, is then proportional to the surface-to-volume ratio. So there's two regimes that you can extract from all of the theory behind this paper. In the short time limit, we see that the diffusion that we measure as function time is equal to the diffusion of the free probe molecule <coughs> times this uh, term in square brackets here. And we notice then so that we have the square root time of the diffusion distance here, but more importantly, we can extract the surface to volume ratio in the short time limit. So what we're going to do is we're going to perform a series of experiments, varying big delta, and then at the long time, when the molecules can then diffuse over a much greater length scale of a single pore, we then reach the tortuous limit. 
And so we take then the ratio of the long time diffusion coefficient that we extract from a Stretzkel Tanner plot, and then we normalize that relative to then the free liquid, and therefore we get the fair function of the tortuosity as well. So here's the data, okay, so this is representing PFG NMR data that's been fitted to Stretzkel Tanner. We've varied the observation time at the bottom, and now we've got then three different curves for the uh, immersion time that the pellet has spent in the challenging dissolution medium. So we did it two minutes, four minutes, and eight minutes, and here we see the diffusion coefficients that we extract from the Stretzkel Tanner plots. We then go back to the theory and then fit that to this horrible looking equation here. We're not going to go into the details, but we see that we have our surface to volume ratio here, our tortuosity here, and this theta is a fitting parameter. So the tortuosity, we actually pump, plug into that. We don't fit that. So there's only two free parameters here. So we extract the surface to volume ratio, and this is a time parameter here as well. So now that we've done that, what we can do is we can look at the evolution of the surface to volume ratio because we've extracted that from the fit and the tortuosity. So on the left here, we have a plot of how the surface to volume ratio varies with immersion time. And we see that essentially for both uncoated drug loaded and uncoated placebo pellets, we see that the surface to volume ratio decreases with time as the water gets into the matrix and dissolves away parts of the pore structure. Therefore, things are decreasing. We get similar surface to volume ratios, though, because we've got the error bars kind of overlapping here. And this suggests that the pore size distributions are fairly similar. And we'll show later that this is confirmed by other experiments done using mercury pore asymmetry. OK, in terms of tortuosity, uh, we have a consistently higher tortuosity from the uncoated placebo. And this can be seen as that they are having a more tortuous network, or conversely, a lower tortuosity for the drug-loaded pellets. Okay, suggesting that we have a more connected porous network when we have the drug in there. So, when we put all of this together, we measure also at the same time the T2 distribution. And using the brownstein tarr approach of exchange and surface relaxation, you can then eventually come up with the pore size evolution with time of the drug-loaded placebo pellets. And so what we see for the drug-loaded pellets is a nice unimodal peak, essentially, at the beginning. And then that gradually increases in size with time, giving us a nice well-behaved system. For the placebo pellets, it's not quite as nice. We almost have a bimodal type of distribution here with some smaller pores around here that tend to sort of disappear with time. And then the larger peak here essentially remaining constant uh, up until around about 20 minutes. And what we think here is that we've actually got a heterogeneous a uh, mix of the excipients uh, in the placebo pellets where we have the lactose possibly being located on its own. So that's dissolving away first. And then maybe just a little bit of the other, um, the uh, lactose is then contributing to this overall slight increase there. So there are differences there which we can attribute. Here is the proof that the pore size distributions are realistic. So these are completely independent. We haven't cheated and matched the uh, peaks of these pore sizes here, so there's the pore radius. Here's the one of the placebo pellet, and this is one derived from mercury pore asymmetry. So we're fairly confident that we've got the right numbers here, which is important, obviously, for our modeling that we're going to show in a moment. So we want to add value to pharmaceutical re research. We want to be funded in the future. So how are we going to do that? Well, the student, James Collins, was a very clever chap, and he managed to do a lot of NMAR experiments on this exact same system. So not only did he look at, obviously, pellet tortuosity and porosity, which we can say as a function of time. We can look at water uptake via NMR profiling. We can also then dope the drugs with other nuclei. So we can look at the dissolution rate of the solid drug from its solid form into the liquid form. You get a nice broad line for the dissolution, and then see a nice spike appearing as it goes from the solid form into the solution. You can then do a PFG ex diffusion experiment of that drug, and then look at the effective diffusivity of the drug out through the pellet itself. So James put all this together. I don't understand this by any, any means, and he solved that um, for a sphere in 1D, so we projected it all down to make it a lot more computationally um, unintensive. And essentially, he came up with these results here. So the red data is the actual drug release. So, okay, so this is where we've then taken out um, uh, aliquots from the solution, and we've analyzed it with UV or HPLC. So this has got the percentage drug released, and we've got three repeats <coughs> uh, of the data here. And so 
The model now that James um, came up with shows you that this is the percentage of the water going into the pores. Here's the behavior of the drug in a solid phase. So initially, that's 100%. As water gets in and solubilizes it, it obviously decreases. And obviously, then we can calculate the drug dissolved in the pores now as well. So when James then did it for a single pellet, we had this curve here, and we were a little bit disappointed. We thought, well, there's quite a bit of overprediction of our actual experimental model compared to then the actual physical data. So then what James did, if you remember the photograph, there was lots of different sizes of those pellets. And so then he introduced a stochastic model into his um, simulation, about 100 pellets here. And that then comes up with you know, a much better fit from about 5 to 20 minutes. But it's still not perfect. You'll notice that, again, we've got some <coughs> underprediction of this part here. And so that's where MRI imaging came in. And so we took some of these pellets during the um, dissolution procedure, we imaged them, and lo and behold, what we see is we see some cracking occurring. Okay, so the cracking occurring increases the surface area, leading then to a burst release of the drug here. Okay, so that explained that quite nicely. Okay, so that's pharmaceuticals. Uh, now we're going to move on to a different area and um, how we can use magnetic resonance in heterogeneous catalysis. And in particular, I'm going to show how you can combine imaging spectroscopy and diffusion to learn a little bit more about deactivation mechanisms. So the challenge in heterogeneous catalysis is really understanding what happens at the angstrom scale and how we scale that up to the meter scale. So here, catalysis is dominated by chemical kinetics, but when you have to make your catalysts in the millimeter and centimeter scale, then the chemistry can be dominated by heat and mass transfer effects. The beauty of NMR, in its forms of PFG, in its forms of relaxometry, essentially allows us to then cover a range of length scales, all the way from the meters, all the way down to microns, and there's other techniques that do get you into the nanometer scales as well. So we've got a good toolkit here to look at and try and bridge this knowledge gap that we have. And so here's our fixed bed MR compatible reactor. We want to do things at high temperature and high pressure. So Clearly, we can't put metal in because we need RF penetration. So we had a reactor made out of silicon nitride, steel end caps that stick out of the RF region. And so the reactor diameter is 40 millimeters OD, 20 millimeters ID. And this will operate up to 350 degrees C and 30 bars worth of pressure. And so here it is. It's all swaddled in insulation here to stop us burning our off RF coils. And essentially, then that goes in here and sits and comes out. You can see there's a loop there. And so what we wanted to do initially, because this is new ground for us, is we wanted to just do some very simple uh, experiments of vapor liquid equilibrium. And so we've got pure cyclohexane, and we have going to put that in a packing of titania uh, pellets in cylinders, three millimeter mesoporous materials. And what we're going to do is we're going to cook that up to 188 degrees C and then vary the pressure. So this is looking at sort of like an absorption isotherm, if you like. And we just want to know, if we measure the diffusion of this whole bed, are we going to get a liquid-like diffusion or are we going to get a gas-like diffusion, given that they can be four orders of magnitude different? So these are the results that we got. If you look in the traditional chemical engineering literature, there are many correlations that you can use. But if we look at liquid cyclohexane at 188 degrees and 12 bar, the wilkie chang correlation says that you should get a value for the diffusion coefficient of around about 10 to the minus 8 meters squared per second. And so if you look at the point close to saturation here, this is the relative saturation, we're getting a point that's around about this point, but it's slightly lower because it's modified by the tortuosity of the pellet. Okay, So the tortuosity of it is about 2, 2.5, so you can divide that value. So this is all well and good. However, if we look then at the uh, correlation for gas phase at 188 degrees C and 12 bar, Chapman Engskog says that we should be in the 10 to the minus 7 region, and that's way off the top of the plot here, which is why that red arrow is there. But this is indeed the diffusion data as we decrease uh, the relative saturation, and we notice that the diffusion is actually increasing. Okay? Why is it increasing? Well, it was mentioned yesterday that we have capillary condensation, and of course, if we've got capillary condensation in pores, we also have then it in equilibrium with the gas phase. And so liquids and gases generally can all differ by two to three or four orders of magnitude. So then you get a weighted average 
of the diffusion coefficient, which is what we're measuring. So here we're getting an increase because of the weighted average. You'll notice that we've got a one single point here that goes down after that point. And we thought, well, is that an error? And we went back to the data and looked and we said, no, it's not an error. And then as any sort of good students go, they go to the literature and have a look to see whether this has seen be been seen before. And indeed it was by your Karger again. I think he showed some of this yesterday. So you get a turnover point. Why do you get a turnover point? Well, at the low pressures, essentially what is happening is now is that we're losing the gas phase and we're moving into a single monolayer of the liquid now just diffusing along the surface. So we now have surface diffusion. Surface diffusion is then much slower, which is why we get this turnover point. So it's nice to see that we get the same sort of behavior at high temperatures and high pressures than we do at sub-ambient um, pressures and temperatures. So in the last sort of four minutes or so, I'm going to tell you then about a reaction that we're going to do under some high temperature, high pressure conditions. So this was part of the OCMOL. This is a European Framework 7 project that we were involved in. And we were tasked to look at the oligomerization of ethene. Okay, so that's that molecule there, putting ethene molecules together to make liquid fuels effectively. And so what we did is we got our reactor. We filled it then with three millimeter nickel silica alumina um, catalysts, okay, that's why we've got broad lines, because we've got nickel in there, we all know that's pretty nasty in terms of NMR. And what we're doing is we're working at 110 and 200 degrees, the results I'm going to show today are 110 degrees, nearly 29 atmospheres of e ethene flowing into this reactor, so what happens? Well, if you've got ethene flowing into a reactor and you get no reaction, because all of the hydrogens are equivalent, you get a really nice single line of olefinic hydrogens at around about 5 ppm. When they do hit the active site of the catalyst and say two molecules do react, the simplest product there is then one butene. And of course, then we lose. Uh, so we increase our hydrogen density, but we also create saturated or aliphatic bonds as well as olefinic bonds. So we get a nice blue peak on the right hand side representing our saturated products that are being formed. And so what we do is we're going to follow that with time. But we're also going to image the bed as well to see what's going on. So let's talk about the image. So this is a vertical section through our column. OK, our ethene is flowing in at the top. And as we get more and more reaction going on, we get more and more products being formed, which is why we then get the increase in the signal as the aliphatic chains are increasing further down the bed. What we've then done is we've done a 1D CSI sequence, so a chemical shift imaging in the vertical direction. And then we've pulled out the spectra at the levels indicated by the uh, boxes in the white dots there. And so what we notice, peak on the left is your reactant, and then the peak on the right is your product. And we see that increasing as we go down the bed, as we'd expect. So that's six minutes after the introduction of the uh, ethene gas at the top. If we then look at that again 40 minutes and then four hours later, what we notice is that we now get a decrease in our products. Okay, and again, that happens consistently down the bed as well. So why is that? Well, that's because we're getting deactivation occurring, OK? Our catalyst is doing something that it's not meant to do. And so how then can we use or find out why that deactivation mechanism is happening? Well, what we then did is we then said, well, let's have a look at the diffusion coefficients uh, along the length of the bed. And if you do that, what in fact you get is that at the top of the bed, you get diffusion coefficients typically around about 2 times 10 to the minus 7. So if you cast your minds back to the cyclohexane experiment, that's in the region where we can have exchange between the gas and the liquid in the pores, OK? But it's telling us 10 to the minus 7 is going to be the lighter element. So you've got your ethene, you've got your butenes, maybe a bit of pentene there as well because of the diff diffusivity. If you look at the magnitude of the diffusion coefficient of all these light areas down here, they're about three to four orders of magnitude slower than the ones at the top of the bed. So that's telling us what we've made here is we've made really long chain linear alpha olefins of up to C30, C40, waxes essentially. And so when you make your waxes, what happens is that they will not get out of the pores. They don't have time to diffuse out the pores. And so therefore, they're blocking the active sites. And that's why the bed is deactivating. So I've gone over by 30 seconds. But I just thought I'd put this in. I was asked last night, and it wasn't in the talk. So I was up a little bit later than I should have been. And this is uh, the man himself, Heston Blumenthal, had the uh, world's best restaurant for about two or three years. And he wanted to look at the marinating process of chicken ticker. So this revolting looking mixture is garlic and ginger. 
and that's chicken. And yes, it did smell foul. Boom, boom. And he wanted to, me to make this in the lab. So here's me putting it into a birdcage coil, two chicken fillets wrapped in this marinating mix. There's me trying to explain to a non-scientist what I'm doing. So I'm taking a slice through the um, chicken tikka breast, which are hanging vertically. And you can see the images on the right hand side here. And so it's really a more a bit of a fun, but here on the left, we looked at the garlic and ginger marinade from zero to four hours. And then what we did is we took those out, cleaned them off, and then put yogurt and only on, you know, pointing at the screen, put yogurt only on this one here, which you can see. And so hopefully the movie will work. So you see then some contrast. And the BBC tried to get me to say, is it the flavors going in? I'm saying, no, you're looking at water and the effects of relaxation, but <laughs> it's very tough to uh, deal with their researchers. And so at the end of the day, we do see some differences. You see sort of an enhanced contrast uh, for the uh, chicken breast that has had the yogurt put on after it. Maybe it's opening up the structure a bit. But my conclusions were, Basically, you should always dice and score your chicken before you start marinating it, so you increase the surface area, effectively. <laughs> Overnight's enough. OK, don't put it in for 24 hours. And if you don't want to do any of that anyway, I would say become a vegetarian. <laughs> so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues, Lynn Glad and Andy Siederman, and all the other people who've done the hard work over the years, and you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Did you get to sample the chicken? No, and he still owes me a uh, date at his restaurant as well. So if you do see him. <laughs> Let him know. With your drug release data, drug release yes. measurements, uh, did you measure those in pH environment? Of yes, so this is a phosphate buffer solution okay. at 37 degrees. So the second one is, have you compared the diffusion data to T2 relaxation data, since you have a surface to volume ratio? If so you assume that this is a sphere, then you can compare the restricted size to surface to volume from so the diffusion. So what we wanted to use this, the surface to volume for, was because in that Brownstein tar model is a surface relaxivity term, yeah. which is always assumed. But you've got an independent measurement of the surface to volume ratio oh. from the uh, okay. So okay. So that's what you want. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sure, I loved your talk. I, I'm wondering about the big effect in the diffusivity during the deactivation, where you looked at, uh, at the eth ethane reaction, and only a, a small decrease in the amount of product produced. Uh, and did you try to consider it analytically? So since uh, th this should say something about the influence of diffusion on the overall reaction, a very uh, central question of chemical engineering, as you know. So the, uh, the spectra that you showed there are as quantitative as we can get them. So obviously, at the top of the bed, you have low, low, low uh, hydrogen density. And obviously, as you start to perimeterize things at the bottom, so that gone off. Um, then you get the, the longer chain as well. Now, I didn't put any of, the, up any of the proportions of the diffusion coefficients, but you can get them, and yes, you can work out what proportions of what compounds you have there. But that's for another talk. It's just to show that what we can do helps us understand the mechanisms of deactivation. I think it's a work in progress. Okay, I think there's some coffee and tea waiting for us outside, so we should probably stop here.